In 1903, Henri Becquerel, Pierre Curie, and Marie Curie were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for their work in discovering radioactivity while working with uranium that emitted rays which would fog up photographic plates. Marie Curie coined the term radioactivity to describe the phenomena that they observed and developed techniques for isolating radioactive materials. Radioactivity is the process by which nuclei emit particles and rays. Radiation refers to the penetrating rays and particles emitted by radioactive sources, such as the uranium or pitch blend that the Curies worked with. There are three major types of radiation, and those are alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Alpha and beta are particles, and gamma radiation is made of rays. An alpha particle is a positively charged particle that is identical to a helium nucleus, which is two protons and two neutrons. Alpha particles are written like this in isotope notation, or are sometimes written with a Greek letter alpha. Here, uranium-238 releases an alpha particle and is transformed into thorium-234. The masses of 234 and 4 add up to 238. The atomic numbers, 90 and 2, add up to 92, so this equation is balanced. Now, alpha particles don't travel very far and are easily stopped by your skin or a piece of paper. But if you swallow alpha particles, it can cause damage to your tissues. A beta particle is an electron resulting from the breaking apart of neutrons in an atom. The neutron breaks into a photon and an electron, which is the beta particle. A beta particle is written like this in isotope notation, or with the Greek letter beta. You can think of beta radiation as a neutron breaking into a proton and an electron. So when you see radioactive decay like this, you'll know that a neutron has undergone a change into a proton and an electron. The numbers at the top and the bottom of the isotope notation still add up to a balanced equation. Beta particles are more penetrating than alpha particles, but can be stopped by a few millimeters of body tissue, thin pieces of wood, or aluminum foil. Gamma rays are high-energy photons emitted by a radioisotope. They often accompany alpha and beta radiation, but have no mass and no electrical charge. They are very penetrating and damaging to the human body. They can be mostly stopped by several centimeters of lead or several meters of concrete, but not completely. Whether or not a nucleus will decay depends on nuclear stability. The stability will depend on having the right number of neutrons in relation to the number of protons. Usually, it's between a 1 to 1 and 1 and a half to 1 ratio of neutrons to protons. Ultimately, it's the neutron to proton ratio that determines the type of decay that will occur. If there are too many neutrons or too few neutrons, radioactive decay will bring stability to the nucleus. If there are too many neutrons, the nucleus will decay by beta emission, where a neutron will turn into a proton and an electron, which is a beta particle. If there are too few neutrons, there are two ways to solve the problem, electron capture or positron emission. Both of these will bring the ratio of protons and neutrons to a more stable place. During electron capture, an electron in an atom's inner shell is drawn into the nucleus where it combines with a proton, forming a neutron and a neutrino. The neutrino is ejected from the atom's nucleus. Neutrinos have very little mass, much less than even electrons, and have no charge. I'm not going to dive into what neutrinos are in this video, but I do want you to be aware that they are also released during electron capture. In positron emission, a positron is formed. It's a particle with the mass of an electron, but a positive charge. During positron emission, a proton changes into a neutron and releases a positron, creating a more stable nucleus. The mass number and atomic numbers are balanced in this equation. If all the starting and ending masses of a nuclear reaction were measured very, very, very accurately and precisely, you would find that the mass is not completely conserved. But the matter has not been destroyed, it's been converted into energy that was released in radioactive decay. This can be accounted for using Einstein's equation of energy equals mass times the acceleration of light. Mass and energy have a relationship. Every radioisotope will decay at different speeds. A half-life is the time required for one half of the nuclei of a radioisotope sample to decay into products. It's often written as T with a one-half subscripted. Let's look at this decay curve to see what happens as a radioisotope decays. 
we will begin with 100% of the parent isotope, with none of it decayed. As time passes, some of the radioactive isotopes will decay into atoms of a new element. When half of the isotope is decayed, it's been one half-life. As that same amount of time passes, half of the remaining atoms of the isotope will decay. At the second half-life, 25% of the atoms remaining are the original isotope. And at the third half-life, only 12.5% of the original radioisotope remains. This pattern continues until all of the radioisotope has decayed into the daughter isotope. But just how long does this take? The length of a half-life will vary between each radioisotope. Some are fractions of a second, some are billions of years. Carbon-14's half-life is 5,730 years. Potassium-40 is 1.25 billion years. Radon-222 is 3.8 days, and Uranium-235 is 700 million years. We can use our knowledge of half-lives to our advantage to find out how old things are. Radiometric dating is a technique used to date materials such as rock or carbon, usually based on a comparison between the observed abundance of radioactive isotopes and its decay products using known decay rates. One of the most well-known types of radiometric dating is carbon-14 dating. Carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14 by beta emission. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, and all living things have some carbon-14 incorporated into their bodies. Small amounts of carbon-14 isotope naturally exist. Plants will make carbohydrates with that carbon as they do the process of photosynthesis. Animals eat those plants and incorporate the C14 into their body tissues. Living things have a continuous supply of C14 while they're alive, but when they die, the carbon-14 that's in their body won't be replenished and can only decay into nitrogen-14 from here on out. Scientists can look at the tissues of long-dead plants and animals and measure the amount of carbon-14 left to figure out how long ago that creature died. So let's try a sample calculation using half-life. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. When woolly mammoth died, it contained 2.00 times 10 to the negative 12 grams of carbon-14. If three half-lives have passed, how much carbon-14 will remain? Well, three half-lives would be 17,190 years, so this is a pretty old, dead, woolly mammoth. What we'll do here is figure out how many grams of the carbon-14 is left by multiplying 2.0 times 10 to the negative 12 grams times one-half three times. Then our answer is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 13 grams. Now this is smaller than the amount we started with, so our answer here makes sense. In addition to being useful for dating long-dead organisms, radiation has many medical uses. The two main uses are for therapy and imaging. Therapies use radiation to kill cancer cells and include boron neutron capture therapy, gamma knife radiosurgery, and brachytherapy. Imaging techniques include x-ray, CT scans, MRIs, PET, and SPECT scans. In addition to therapy and imaging, UV radiation is also used to sterilize equipment. Thanks for watching this episode of Teacher's Pet. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow me on Twitter at SciencePet.